Well, you might as well do it as a backup, but um, I think I am. I'm also recording it here, so um, I've just moved the mic. But yeah, if you can, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I've just moved the mic, so I, it, it, the mic is good here because I use it on Skype all the time. Good. Well, welcome to Fellowship today. Um, my name's Ian Valentine, and uh, I'm going to teach you a little bit on a subject that um, we should all do. And it's like the, at the beginning of the new year, we always think, oh, I really must get more exercise, or I really must tell my wife I love her more, or I really must, you know, watch less TV, or I really must, and we make all these New, resolu new Year's resolutions and all these plans. And one of the things that I think we really must do, you know, that in our New Year's resolutions, and it's very clear from God's word about this, is we all need to pray more, yeah? We all need to pray more. And so tonight I'm going to look at prayer and I'm going to take you through some sections of God's word to show you a bit more about prayer. And specifically, there are many words in God's word for prayer and they all mean different things, right? So we're focusing on one which is prasukamai, if I can say it right, which is basically prayer that is two things. It's directly to God, it's you and God, you talking to God directly and it has a sense of earnest earnestness right it's like like the kind of like highest uh defcom 5 prayer it's the things that it's not just you you know chatting things over with him it's not just you you know wishing or desiring or making you know the odd request say well perhaps perhaps this it's where god i need to grab your shirt tails and pull your attention here because you need to listen to this right now right that's right urgent uh it's uh earnest prayer directly between the son and his father right and it's important to understand that we've we've been given access to do this right now not all of our prayer is like this but we do have access to the father um and let's start in uh, matthew chapter 21 just to sort of set the groundwork here um this is really a simple teaching but it's a very very important teaching and it's something that when we think about you know, going to the gym or doing, telling our wives we love them more or doing all these great things, we ought to be thinking, really, I ought to pr be praying more or doing more of this. In Matthew 21, it's the great and simple parable, starting in verse 19, and it says, not a parable, a, th a, a lesson that Jesus Christ taught about the fig tree. And it says, and when he saw the fig tree in the way, he came to it and found, found, and found nothing thereon but leaves only. He said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth for evermore. And presently or immediately the fig tree withered away. So Christ spoke something into being um, with this fig tree. And the fig tree reacted to the, the authority uh, of the Lord here. And, and basically this fig tree withered, uh, withered away. And it's funny because I was speaking to Rarish this morning on, on my walk to work. And he was talking about the energy that some, uh, apparently there's a Japanese... Uh, tree hugging karate move or something about transferring energy to trees that's the key if you only really understood what christ did here this is uh the real mccoy um not some karate move about tree hugging but it says in verse 20 when the disciples saw it they marveled saying how soon is the fig tree with the like how quick that got results right basically was their marvel and jesus's lesson in verse 21 was i say unto you verily i say unto you if ye have faith and doubt not. Ye shall not only do that which is done unto this fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, if ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, that's this prayer we're talking about, believing, ye shall receive. Now, this is an amazing lesson that he's teaching about the power of prayer and the power of going to God in faith. I mean, it, there is no sort of beating around the bush here. Did you get that one? I thought, yeah, that, was, yeah. thought that was really funny. <laughs> There's no beating around the bush here. You know, it's, it's exactly, you know, it's results. It's, it's results. It's basically results straight away. Um, let's go to Luke because many people, you know, don't understand. They think, they think oh, if, I've, if I'm really spiritual, then, um, 
you know, I don't have to pray as much, you know, because I'm so spiritual, right? Or I know so much of God's word, I don't have to pray as much. But the lesson that the Lord Jesus Christ gave us was completely the opposite, right? He probably was the epitome of having a close relationship with God. And he prayed a lot, right? And he set a great example. Um, in Luke 6 and in verse 12, in a very, very crucial time, um, before he chose the 12 apostles, he went up onto a mountain and he prayed all night. In verse 12 it says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto his disciples of them he chose twelve whom he named apostles. So at a really crucial point in his ministry where he chose the twelve apostles, he did what we would call pulling an all-nighter. You know, he worked all night, but he worked in prayer. You know, sometimes when I've got a deadline or a big report to write or, you know, someone's wanting something, I have to work all night and we don't sleep. And then you just carry on the next morning and maybe you get a cat nap. Um, Christ thought it was so important to pray at this time that he did it all night on his own, the mountain, right? And here's the Son of God who has a pretty good relationship with the Father. So, you know, there's some work to be done in prayer at these times when we're facing important decisions or at times when we're really looking to 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 get to the Lord to, to to either give us direction or to fix something or or whatever. Um, prayer is the solution, and prayer is the way Christ dealt with these situations. And if you don't believe me, in Luke chapter twenty-two, right? So same book, just on a bit. There's the record of him before he was taken to be tortured and eventually crucified. And in Luke 22, 40, um, and when he was in that place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. He was withdrawn from them, stones cast, and kneeled down and prayed. Right At this time when Christ was looking to the to his father to say, is there any other way that we can deal with this salvation issue, Father, you know, apart from me having to sacrifice my life, then please tell me now. This is your last chance, God, to tell me if I don't have to actually go through with this. And, of course, they talked it over, and Christ knew that actually he knew all the Old Testament prophecies, he knew everything, and he, he knew that's what had to be done. Um, and he went through with it. But the way he dealt with this it, it was in prayer. And Christ did not, you know, shirk prayer by any means it was a absolute part of his close fatherly relationship and he couldn't have walked with the wisdom he walked in or uh, the power he walked in or the closeness he walked in without having that great prayer life so actually prayer is what deepens our relationship with God it's not it's not something that we do uh, when we you know it's not something that you don't need to do once you've quote arrived unquote it's something that we should be doing more of all the time if we want to be close to the Father and, and, and have his will in our lives. And it's, it's very clear that if it was necessary in Jesus Christ's walk, then for us to think it's not necessary in our walk is, is woefully wrong, woefully wrong. Um, so do you get my drift about, you know, if I ought to be going to the gym more, maybe perhaps I ought to be praying more. Um, Acts 1 um, 24, we see the same pattern here, is that in the time after Christ was ascended and they had to choose another apostle um, because of Judas, Judas's suicide, um, it says in verse 24, and they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show if either of these two men thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship. So they really went to the Lord, even just the choice between two guys that were both probably well qualified and both good. You know, these apostles went to the Lord in prayer, said, look, we want to get this right, right? So their way to get it right was to go to the Lord and pray. Um, beginning to get the picture here, right? Uh, 
involving God in prayer has great effect. Yeah, great effect. Um, so let's go to Acts 4, move on a little bit more and see. Um, Acts 4, we can, this is a great section. Um, let's start in uh, verse 27 where he's saying, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel who gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. So at the time when they were under great persecution, right, at the beginning of the first century church, what did they do? They went, they went to God and said, hey, behold their threatenings. Grant unto thy servants with all boldness we may speak thy word. By stretching forth thy hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child, Jesus. So in the face of persecution and block, roadblocks in their Christian ministry, in their walk, having got born again and in doing the will of God and setting forth their hands to heal, they went to God and they said, look, you know, give us the strength to do more. All right. In the, in, the, in the situation, they didn't say, okay, you know, we'll take a holiday because of this roadblock and we'll come when times are better. You know, and in verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, they got more filled, or they got filled to overflowing, or the Spirit manifested itself in them with wisdom and power and signs following. Why? Because they, went, they, they got energized through prayer. That's he went to God in prayer and then took it, um, took it on and, uh, and went forward from there. Um, you can see this. It's, it's, it's just great to look at this. Um, they took it seriously. The job, of, the job of prayer was a serious work of the ministry. Right? When you were setting aside time to pray, it wasn't downtime or lost time or unproductive time it was seen as being perhaps the most important work you could be doing yeah um in acts chapter six in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied there arose a murmuring of the grecians against the hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministrations and the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said um it is not reason that we should leave the word of god and serve tables Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may anoint, appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. So when the ministry got bigger in the first century church, to the point where the actual day-to-day -day, you know, effort of organizing things and getting things done in the church was taking up too much time, for the apostles, they said, hang on a sec, you know, this is eating into my prayer time. You know, this is, we're not getting enough prayer time here. We're not getting enough time ministering the word. So what we'll do is we'll organize ourselves so that other people can do this. They look for people that were full of the Holy Spirit and, and great hearted men to, to do this ministry in the church. But their priority was prayer and the ministry of the word. You know, and that, that's actually the, um, the priority you know, the priority that we should have. Um, in Acts 10, we'll skip over that, but remember in Acts 10, you know, thy prayer and thy arms are come up before God. It said, and the first Gentile that got born again was born again. Why? Because he had gone to, gone to the Lord in prayer. You know, God organized Peter and everyone to go to his house as an answer to prayer. And he was the first Gentile to ever get born again. Um, let's read on a bit Acts chapter 12. Verse 5, right? Because this is, I think, a great example. You know, you know the, the story of Cornelius, but here's a, this is a great example. Um, 
And this is a time when Peter basically is in prison. So Acts 12, 5, it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So here we are, you know, Peter, one of these leaders in the church, is suddenly, you know, knocked up in prison and they don't know what's going to happen to him and, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're going to, you know, kill him. Or I mean, the church is pretty worked up about this. And, and it says prayer was made without ceasing of the church. And they didn't leave a second of the day that there wasn't prayer being offered for this situation. In other words, they didn't cease to pray, right? It says that. It says, I mean, that's just what it says. It says, prayer was made without ceasing of the church of God unto him. That doesn't mean that everyone was there praying without ceasing. It means that the church collectively was praying without ceasing. You know, they, they, they continued in prayer. Verse 6, and when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. So he's really closely guarded. He's sleeping between two soldiers. You can't get more closely guarded than that, right? Bound with two chains, not one, but two, right? And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And then outside the room, there were more, more guards. But none of that is in, in any way a problem if God wants to set him free. <laughs> you know what happened if you read the story it's great verse 7 and behold the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and the angel smote Peter on the side because Peter was uh, he was a fast sleep right the angel woke him up right smote him on the side and raised him up saying arise up quickly so the angel had some you know a plan here it's just like you know, Tom Cruise and you know, uh, whatever it is, Mission Impossible here, breaks in, angel comes in, wakes him up, beats him on the side, says, arise quickly, and the chains fell from his hands. Now, the thing is here, prayer, m prayer mobilized angels. Understand? That's what this prayer did. The prayer mobilized angels to get the will of the Lord done. He smote Peter on the side and you know, the chains fell off from his hands and the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and I'll get dressed, bind on thy sandals, put your shoes on. So what did Peter do? He got dressed and he put his shoes on. And he said to him, Cast thy garment about thee, now put on your coat. It's pretty specific here. <laughs> right? And follow me. That's basically what the angel said. And he went out and followed him. The angel, uh, Peter followed the angel and wist or knew not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he was in, in a vision. So Peter's kind of going, is this a dream? Right? Because this angel kicks him on the side, wakes him up, tells him to get dressed, tells him to put his coat on, tells him to put his shoes on, the chains just fall off his hand by, as if by magic, and he says, follow me, and they just walk out together. They just walk straight out of the jail. Verse 9, and he went out, right, and verse 10, and when they were past the first and the second ward, or section of the prison that is, they came unto the iron gate. So this is the final kind of gate. And you can imagine walking up to this big iron gate, you know, the angel and Peter, uh, that leadeth to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. So Peter's just walking up to this gate, and it opened on its own. Now, we're used to doors that open on their own. But this guy, you know, and this is, we're talking about first century churches, no hydraulics. No sliding doors, no Star Trek style, you know, doors. The door at its own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And then Peter, you know, was come to himself, you know, figured it all out, and he said, Now I know surely that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the. Uh, expectation of the people of the Jews and when he had considered the thing he came to the house of Mary the mother of John whose surname was Mark where many were gathered together praying yeah so this this whole miracle came about because the believers were praying for Peter and it moved uh, and and it was so powerful that an angel got involved to sort it out and fix it um 
And as Peter knocked uh, at the door of the gate, a damsel came forth, his name is Rhoda. And uh, it's a bit funny there because they thought they'd seen the ghost. Hey, just here, it must be a ghost. No. Uh, but, you know, we are instructed pray. Um, and I'm just like thinking that we ought to think about you know, I know that we've started a prayer night on a on a Friday. Um, it's a really healthy thing. And thinking about what the Word says about prayer, you know, you couldn't think of a better thing to do. You know, we know things like it says, "Be in Philippians four six, be anxious or careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God." That first word, prayer, there is the same word, prosukomai. Um, so earnest, direct to the Father, request, you know, it's the earnest communication of you directly to the Father in situations where you need to get his attention. Um, just one bit before, we're going to close by looking at the Lord's Prayer as an example. But before we do that, I just want to show you First Peter 3, 7. Um, in First Peter three seven, it says, "Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge." Now, this is talking about husbands and wives together, and it says the husbands are to dwell with their wives according to knowledge, or with a with a deep under, and tender understanding of their women are, so that the man can properly take care of and cherish and protect and you know nurture the wife right likewise husbands dwell with them according to knowledge that's what this according to knowledge bit is giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel you know the the husband protects the heart of the wife because the wife is very sensitive because women are very sensitive they're like fragile but very valuable vases no i'm just so men need to understand this and that's how we dwell with our wives. We don't, don't kick them about, we don't take them for granted, we don't, you know, we, we, pre we treasure them as, as weaker vessels. Um, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, this is a beautiful thing, heirs together of the grace of life. This, this expression of uh, a husband and wife being heirs together of the grace of life I think is beautiful. But the next bit says that your prayers be not hindered. Right. Hindered means disrupted or, or with any blockage, any no blockage. So basically God's word says, you know, as husbands and wives, there's something very special about praying together, especially get it together as a couple. And, you know, it says the opposite. If you're not getting it together as a couple, then your prayers can be hindered. Right. But if you are really in sync and understanding each other, then the two of you you know, in prayer together is, is something that's fantastic. Um, so I thought a good place to finish was actually be Matthew chapter 6. Because something that, about prayer that I think that we don't really take a look at enough is to understand the lesson that Christ was really teaching in the Lord's Prayer. Because everyone always uses the Lord's Prayer in church, says, well, Christ said, pray this, right? And of course he didn't say, pray this. He said, don't pray like the heathens do in vain repetitions, but pray like this. And he gave the Lord's Prayer as an example. So we're not to repetitively repeat the Lord's Prayer, right? But if you look at it, it's a fantastic example. So let's just read from chapter 6 and verse 3. When thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be done in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. See, this prayer is literally, you know, Christ took himself away. He didn't actually pray with the apostles. He went away into the garden and he went away up the mountain and he communed directly 
with the Lord, you know, in this work, this work of prayer. It's something that is, if you like, very personal. Um, and verse 5 says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. So the reason for praying is that the people can see that they're praying, right? not that they're talking to God. Um, Verily I say unto you, they have their reward, which is simply the recognition they got from the guys looking at them, nothing else. Verse 6 says, But thou, when thou prayest, enterest into thy closet, you know, the, the secret place, the secret place. And when thou hast shut the door, which means you get rid of all other distractions, right? You cannot pray if you're not focusing on the prayer, right? This kind of prayer is something that takes some focus. It's basically your time with the Father to connect and to give it to him, right? Um, and that means no distractions, right? You get into the closet, you lock the door, you shut the door, Pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 7 says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard by their much speaking. You know, it's not rosary beads, it's not repeating, repeating, repeating. It's not, no, no, no. You know, it's, it's actually a heartfelt... Uh, earnest the, the emphasis is in the earnest and direct communication um, to the father right pray not with repetitions as the heathen do for they think that they should be heard by their much speaking you know it's not the quantity it's the quality right so you can actually get I know we've seen that seen that the you know the first century church they prayed without ceasing for Peter to get out of jail but actually, what Christ's teaching here is the quality, not the quantity. It's not the fact that you repeat, repeat, repeat that gets God's attention. I know there's the parable about, you know, the nagging, you know, thing. But that's not what this is about. This is about, you know, you pray until you've got it settled with the Lord, and then, you know, it, it's deep and, and close. Um, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they should be heard for their much speaking. Um, be not Ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what thing you have need of before ye ask him. And it's a very important thing to understand is that you're praying to someone that, you know, your father who's got an open ear of understanding of your situation. So it's like you don't have to go and explain all the details of what's going on because he does understand it. That means that in the prayer you can get right to the crux of the issue. And so it's, Okay, God, before I you know, pray this, let's just you know, give you a bit of a briefing on the situation. <laughs> we don't have to do that, right? Our Father knows the situation before we ask him. So we can get right down to business, right? Say, God, you know, da, 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 da. And he's going, yep, right? So what are you bringing to me, my son? You know, what would you have me do, right? Is, is the kind of uh, communication that's going on. So it says in verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, right? And this was actually Christ's example of prayer, right? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? And in prayer, we should recognize the sovereignty of the Lord. Hallowed be thy name. You know, he has a name which is above every name. He has, you know, everything put under his feet. You know, we can recognize the greatness of the authority to which we're praying, right? And that should be in our opening attitude when we pray, is, you know, we are now addressing the one with the authority in the situation, yeah? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, right? I mean, we, we pray with an understanding that God's will is going to happen anyway, right? It's not like the, you know, the wheels of God grind slowly, but they grind finely, which means that 
we know that God's justice is always going to get done in the end, right? You know, even if Peter had been killed in that prison, it wouldn't have stopped, you know, the new birth and, and, and the Christian church going out. But, you know, the Lord didn't want him killed in that prison. So we should pray with a recognition that God's big plan is fixed, is fixed and going to happen. So you can't pray to change the big plan, right? The kingdom's going to come. You know, you can't pray for it not to come. You can't pray to kind of change anything that's part of that plan because the kingdom's going to come, right? Um, so you have to acknowledge that. And you have to under, understand in your prayer how you fit in to the big plan of the Lord. And in fact, you have to earnestly want that will to happen. Thy will be done as it is in heaven, right? You know, part of our prayer life is actually accelerating, you know, accelerating God's will to happen on the earth. You know, that's really, you know, the essence when we go to God. When Christ went in the garden, what was his prayer? Not my will, but thine be done. You know, what was his expectation when he was trying to choose the apostles it was who do you want lord to be apostles out of these disciples so it's always thy will be done right it's to seek god's will and help it accelerate is is the essence of prayer um thy kingdom come thy will be done as it is in heaven on earth as it is in heaven I mean, we recognize there are injustices on the earth, right? And there are times when God's will doesn't get done on this earth, right? Right now in this administration before Christ comes back. You know, that Elaine Stacy getting killed that night a year ago was not God's will. Um, you know, but the big picture is going to gonna, gonna happen. Um, but we can pray that the authority that he had in heaven is exercised on earth. Right, and that's the essence of this prayer, to open up the authority that is in heaven to happen on earth. Um, give us this day our daily bread. That's just simple, right? You need something today, ask him for it. You know, that's fine. That's just part of this relationship. You know, what, whatever we need. Now, daily bread is kind of like your sustenance. So it's okay to just go to God and absolutely get that sorted out. Forgive us our debts, right? As we forgive our debtors. It's okay. We should be going to God with our failings as well, right? And saying to God, I'm sorry. You know, forgive, forgive us. Lead us not into temptation, right? There are many times when this prayer is used to avoid temptation. You know, you're tempted to just give up on going to fellowship that night or reading the word or doing something that you know is God's will or whatever. And you can see that temptation coming. And one of the ways you deal with that is prayer. It's like, Lord, give me the strength tonight. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You take it to God in prayer and, and, and get around that. Deliver us from evil. There's a lot of that around, right? There's a lot of people that would want to run you down cause you trouble and stand in your way and make your life difficult, right? And one of the things we can pray for is to like get us, Lord, I want to be out of that. I want you to deliver us from that. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He's covered a lot in that short prayer, hasn't he? And there's a lot in that short prayer when you think about, you know, our prayer life with, with God. Um, and that's an example, you know, of prayer it's not something that we should be repeating because it said don't you know pray like the heathens do with vain repetitions um but pray like this he said and that was his uh, sort of no specifics in there you see that was an example of how to pray there wasn't specifics in there like i need to divide these 10 these five loaves and five fishes or i need you to get me out of this situation or any of those things we know that christ did pray for these things and miracles happened right so this is just an example so you can substitute into each one of those bits the things that fit that day so that's a little bit about uh prayer just because you know we're having a a, a prayer night and i think it's really right